So, as I said, again, thank you for joining this uh, room with such a big crowd. I'm really surprised and uh, grateful. My name is Oskar Dudic and I'm here for the first time in Sweden. And I will tell you a bit about CQRS and how .NET and recent improvements can help you in coding in this style. So I'm always showing this picture. There is a Sasquatch here and I'm telling and I'm showing this picture or that one because I'm showing that like CQRS is quite often pictured like a Nessie or like a Sasquatch. Everyone heard about it, no one saw it. So we'll see a bit of CQRS. And we will be doing today a bit of myth, myth busting. I will try to buff, uh, bust some myths and show some facts about CQRS, what is not and what it is about. So we'll answer questions like, does CQRS require multiple databases? And we will check whether it really introduces eventual consistency so everything that we are scaring our business. And does it really need to use Kafka and Rabbit? So if we want to use uh, CQRS, are we al already signing for implementing it with Kafka? And also quite often it's said that CQRS is adding additional overhead to our implementation, to our architecture. We'll have a look on that. And also, does it really need even sourcing? And we will also have a look and discuss what tequila, salt and lemon has to do with that. And a uh, few things about me. As I mentioned, I'm from Poland. I'm a developer with over 15 years experience. Uh, my current um, main interest is about event-driven world. So I'm also a maintainer of the Martin library, which allows to use Postgres as uh, event store. But we won't be talking much about event sourcing besides in the context of the CQRS. And one more additional drawing. Does anyone recognize what it is? It's a drawing of an Atlantis. And in the ancient Greece, Atlantis was shown like the, mo the best approach, like the, the highest technology and the way how we can design the cities. And when I thought, and I would have a look on this picture, and I thought like, well, this is looking like a clean architecture, right? What can be better than clean architecture? We have layers, a lot of layers, a lot of explanation that is go looking quite smart, flow control, etc. But for me, clean architecture is just an onion architecture and not only because of layers, but the specific smell. So onion architecture will be our, will be our main enemy today. And someone can say like, yeah, great. I'm not using clean architecture. I'm using hexagonal architecture, but sorry for me, it's also an onion. So let's see our onion and tr try to unpeel it a bit. So we have like um, controllers, which is quite often like the, the top layer, like a API layer. Then we have our application services, then aggregates, repositories, etc. On each layer, we are creating like the same copy, but for the different entities. So user controller, shopping cart, cart controller, user service, shopping cart service, and so on and so forth. And I'm already tired myself telling about that, but if we have a look on our systems, then in fact we have even more classes because those layers are saying that, you know, you cannot touch uh, the, the layer below. You need to have a contract between them. So models, view models, DTOs, uh, repositories, entities, models, etc. And we also have some other rules like um, we cannot con contact in the breath way, just we need to go deeper, but we all know how that is ending up. So we, if we try to tame it, 
then it's usually ending up with adding some generic code because we don't like to copy and paste. We are doing a lot of mistakes with copy and pasting. Then we are trying to include the generic uh, classes. And what's your record with the number of generic parameters in, in class? <laughs> Mine is 14. 14 parameters. I think the only thing that this class couldn't do was coffee, which was a pity. <laughs> so yeah, we're ending up with this uh, spider web. And of course, I'm coming here today to preach CQRS, <laughs> but we'll see in a nutshell whether this can help us and how it can help us to tame those complexity. Because in theory, the clean architecture and patterns and tooling like DDD, etc., were about taming complexity. But unfortunately, the rea uh, reality is a bit different. So let's discuss what CQRS. And I told CQRS I don't know how many times already, but I haven't talk y told you what's the what's this fancy acronym. So C stands for command, Q stands for query, and RS stands for responsibility segregation. So let's have a look how we could define commands and queries, what are there. So, for example, commands. This can be like a register product, deactivate product, etc. Each of our business operation that we would like to do in our system. How query could look like. For example, get product details, get products. So anything that we want to get out from our system, so the data that we put and uh, created by running commands, we would like to somehow get it and show it to our user or to other integrated system. So the most common way and uh, probably one of the simplest way to explain what's the responsibility segregation is that we should break our systems and slice it by the behavior and the business operations that we would like to run. So command is about intention, about something that we would like to do, some business logic that we would like to do. Of course, it might not succeed because we need to run some validations, etc. But if it's ending up, then it's creating some side effects. And query is like asking a question shouldn't change the answer. So we are when we are asking for some data, then we shouldn't change the state. And if we segregate those two into two types of behaviors, then our system is already becoming a bit more predictable than it was before. Because not only we know what's the business intent and what the business logic we would like to run, but we also know that if we run queries, then no matter how many times we run it, we will get the same result. We won't create any nasty uh, bugs. And for commands, we should not, in general, return some business data. And some people are saying that we should not return any result. And I think that it's OK to return some status of our operation. But the key thing is that we wouldn't like to Mm, give already the caller mm, the information what will be the end result of our op be operation because this user might not know and should not care because then we are creating coupling and we will see where that leads at and I hope that unintentionally I didn't say you already that anything about storage because see, there is no storage here, no, no state change, just intentions, just behaviors, etc. So the sampler, um, sample command handlers could look like that. So we are just telling that this class is just handling uh, r and running some specific business logic. I mean, this is not implemented, so it's not doing anything, but we will get there. And for queries, we are just saying that that's that's fine. We will if you run this query, then I will do some magic and return you the result. Simple as that. And that's probably the most common way of how you are people are handling CQRS in a .NET space. But that's not the only way. 
So how many of you are using uh, tools like Mediator? Yeah, a lot. Great, great, great. We will discuss that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for now, you, you, you don't need to create a class per command. It's totally fine to have a class like a regular service without any interfaces or even without commands objects because CQRS is not about the specific implementation. As long as we segregate those behaviors into some way that they will be handled by different, uh, different classes or different uh, routes, then we're good. We're doing CQRS. So those services, like the year older services, are also fine and can be <coughs> even better than like tiny classes in some way because if we look on this class then immediately we see what API we expose for the products so both in the commands and both in the query way and okay so I show you those dummy records and uh, probably I hope that commands and queries in majority of systems do don't look like that so let's make them a bit smarter so let's add some data to there because intention is not the only thing, but we also need to provide some parameters. So for example, register product can have like a product ID and SKU, so the product number, name, description. And here we already see the benefit of the recent improvements in the .NET space because not only I'm using records which are great for DTOs because they are immutable, I mean, almost immutable, <laughs> if we are consistent. Um, but they are not perfect because they are immutable. So if, if we create this class, then we can trust it in theory. But uh, let's have a look how that would look in practice. I will just add also the queries. We'll get back to them. So let's have a look shortly if records are perfect and we can just use them. So SKU is just a strongly typed number with some additional, potentially additional validation that we would like to run. So we would like to say that SKU follows the specific format. Unfortunately, uh, records currently do not allow to put the validation in, in the constructor. If we were Java developers, they also have records nowadays and they allow to have some validation, but here, it's uh, it's not possible. So as long as we are providing the good values, then that's okay. But records are just synthetic sugar. So we can like even force the null value here there saying like, yeah, I know this is not a null. We are lying, of course. And providing some wrong format as we don't have validation, then we cannot trust those objects. So if we add those uh, static methods, then we could put it there, some validation, like, you know, verifying some, uh, some format, checking the nullability, checking whether the number is positive or not, etc. And which is good because we can then, if we run all of the creation through those methods, then we could trust it, like almost, because we can still use the with syntax that will tell that let's use this valid uh, SKU and put some wrong value there because we are doing nasty things. And we, can, we could defend ourselves from that by doing stuff like this. So, you know, making the constructor private, but then we need to implement on our own the construction and so on and so forth. So write a lot of dually code which I don't intend to do here. So let's say that we are trusting ourselves that all of the creation will be run through the static method. So thanks to that, when we created the command or the query, then we don't need to re repeat those validations and we can trust it and then run the business logic. But that was just a small rant for records, that they are not perfect. No one is perfect besides us. So I promise you in the description of this talk that we will do some real coding and what can be more real coding than 
than using entity framework, right? <laughs> this is the most real code that I can imagine. And I also wanted to show because um, maybe I'm not a, the biggest fan of the entity framework, but undeniable, it's getting much better and better and enabling to write more uh, explicit code. Like, for example, see, I'm using this strongly typed product ID, SKU, etc. Nowadays, uh, entity framework also allows us to use that. So we need to know about that. So entity framework is not so bad as for ORM. And we will also add some, um, some of course, DB context and see we, this is the way how we could use those um, strongly type in two ways. One is for um, like regular pr types, but if we want to, if we want to be able to filter by that, then we need to use the different syntax. And nowadays, .NET framework because we are we were ranting as a C# -sharp developers that there are single page applications everywhere, and nowadays in C# -sharp we can write a single file application, <laughs> which we're gonna do. So let's add it. So we are, and those single file application nowadays can also have the Swagger, um, can run the mm, entity framework, which is great. We can even run migrations, etc. But what's more, we can also define um, we can also define endpoints, and this is called ma minimal APIs, which is minimal APIs per .NET understanding because in other environment like Node.js, like Python, this is the way how you are building your APIs. Well, so it can be simple, like we can define almost the same things if we are not going crazy as we could do with the regular controllers. Um, so we can use dependency injection, we can um, <coughs> we can run the the regular logic so see i'm doing here like a the most cruddish way that i was able to imagine so we are getting some data then we are creating the product id and you know adding the product maybe doing some validation whether we don't have such product with this sku etc and then we are returning some result and this fancy um, and this fancy syntax also give us the Swagger information. So if we do it like that, then Swagger will generate that we are able to return created, but request conflict result, etc. Cool. Um, let's go further. And once we have those uh, our queries, then we can also define it like that. So we can use map get and say that for this route, we would like to run following query. So here I'm just trying to get the um, the product. Then I'm using some fancy syntax to be sure that it's not null. This is how you can check also if it's null or not in C# -sharp nowadays. And then um, I'm returning the value. And then in a similar way, we could define for getting products. So we will be filtering like a uh, paging, adding some filter and checking whether we have some products that are uh, matching some specified filter. And here we are already created a really the simplest uh, CQRS uh, application because we are separated. We sliced our application per behavior. Each endpoint is different behavior. Um, the creation is not returning anything besides the HTTP status and uh, location header and get are not changing any data, which is great. But of course, I don't intend to, to finish the talk at that point because such application could be good like for a conference talk. But uh, I think that we all agree that it's not manageable to, to run such single f file application in the long term. So that's not what I intend you to show. But why, am I, why did I show you that? Because this is already CQRS. Because CQRS is not about storage. 
it's about behavior so what we intend to do let's say that uh, this is our first implementation we somehow get with that into production and then we succeeded and then our business came to us with the more um, business requirements etc then we can expand on that but so CQRS technically can run against the single table, can use ORM, CQRS can be even cruddish like this application. But even with this cruddish approach, we are already getting some benefits like, for example, as we know that we are not changing anything, then we can use some optimization like as no tracking, etc to say that we do not intend to modify anything, so do not track those changes. So um, this, is, this is the simplest implementation of the CQRS. So here, CQRS is, in my opinion, not adding any complexity. But I promise you that we will discuss Mediator, right? So if we would like to make our application, my, our fancy warehouse management system, Mm, to be smarter than that, then we could say like, okay, maybe those endpoints are nice, but they are nice for a Node.js app, not for a .NET. So we could get back to the controller controllers and we could include command bus and command bus would be a simple wrapper like a mediator because more or less that's mod what mediator does. So it tries to get the command, we are sending some command, and then we are saying to dependency injection, give me the command handler for this specific command. And then we are running the handler. So that's more or less all what Mediator is doing, besides adding some possibility to maybe wrap it with some middleware, etc. But how many of you are using behaviors or pipelines from the mediator out of those people okay free and probably previously were like 20 people using mediator so then you should think whether you are using really the the power of this tool or you could just run mediator like that because that's what you would get and you would get much less allocations but we are not here to discuss allocations at least not only so this is probably the most common style of CQRS application I see in the in the in our in in, in my past applications and it also in our uh, my clients. So what we are doing is just preparing command, then sending a command and returning some result. And let's see where is it landing. Then typically we have additional project. An additional project uh, probably has some like nesting by the by the feature like product and then we have this technical split so instead of saying that which feature we are implemented we are saying that yeah here here are my command handlers here are my query handlers repositories etc so let's have a look on the register product handler and what it is doing is using repository because why not we are using entity framework, but let's wrap it into some repository, which is, you know, extremely powerful, especially seeing that what we are doing is just we are already wrapping that ORM. And <coughs> so it has some benefits sometimes, but, uh, you know, the DB context already implements the repository pattern and you need to fork. So why to do it? And then we are getting some, mm, we are calling repository, doing maybe some fancier business logic if we are into DDD space, and then calling again repository. Just for the sake, when I'm asking people, then they are doing just for the sake of unit testing that. Why would you even you unit test that? Like this is just a code like you're getting data, mapping it and storing. So why to add some additional complexity? And for query handlers, quite often it's similar. So we have controller, which is just sending query. And then we have query handler that has, a, again, a repository on some other layer. And inside of that, we are just calling the database. 
So why do we need so many layers if we are claiming that what we intend to do is to do the CQRS? So CQRS is, does not equal mediator because if you are using mediator and you are splitting your application per behavior and type of behavior, segregating them, then that's already okay because that's a good first step. But as you saw, even for this simple application that has a really single entity, then quite often our application look like that. We have layer on top of layer and on, to on top of layer. So our application looks like that. We are still in the onion space, but uh, just sliced. So not only unpeeled, but then we are slicing it. And when we are slicing the onion, what's going to happen? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's how it's ascending usually. So, okay, I'm not only here to rant about records, about Mediator. Mediator is a great tool. It has some powerful features like pipelines, behaviors. Not so complicated that we couldn't write it on our own, but still it's a it's a tool that can be helpful so, and it can be used for CQRS application. I do not intend to discourage from using it. I just wanted to tell you that this is just a first step. So we need to remember wh why we are here for, right? So, and what's our intention? Because if we are just using Mediator to recreate the, the Onion architecture with that, then I think that something went wrong. So, <coughs> I would like to show you the possible different way how you could deal um, with, um, with CQRS. So, instead of having controllers, see, I dropped, deleted uh, all of the controllers that I had in my code here. The only thing that API does is it's saying that, yeah, let's use endpoints. So, warehouse endpoints. And here we have the general configuration for our application. So for our module, this file is located here. And if we had more modules than products, and hopefully we have more than enti one entity and more than one command and two queries in our system, uh, then we can break it down by the products, by, by, by the features, the general features or sub modules. And we could also nest it there, so we could have the configuration inside of product. And instead of just ending with the basic split per sub-modules, so products, shopping carts, etc., and then going further with just having the technical split, we could break it by the specific feature we are implementing. So instead of having like a command handlers, query handlers, as we had in in my so-called mediator example, so see you could compare it. Here we have also products, but then it's like a command handler, a query handler, and what's worse, quite often I see that there is commands are in a different folders and queries. So if we want to implement some feature like add one additional field, then we need to jump around like four or ten even folders to implement it. Um, so for example, here I put the registering endpoint, getting products, getting product details. So let's have a look how that's, that changed. So we have endpoint. Endpoint file just contains information about the the specific endpoint, how it will be handled. And it's quite explicit, so and similar to what we have in this single file um, example. So we can define what, what, what action we would like to do. So we would like to register a new product and we can use this endpoint as our application service. So everything that we need to orchestrate um, to, to keep our domain so-called clean from the technical aspect, we could do it here. Why to introduce more layers like controller, application service, domain service? For me, I'm quite often asked like, okay, Oscar, so is command a part of domain space or application space? Or should I put this class into infrastructure layer or application layer? 
And of course, I'm trying to be polite and explain that. But in general, my initial thought when I hear this question again, then it's like, I don't care. For me, it's the most important is to be able to isolate our business logic and to be able to run some tests, like a unit test without the IO operation, etc., if possible. And then having the rest. So it's like a business logic and the whole surroundings. So I don't care. Why do we need so many layers? And this code is already looking quite similar to like a serverless approach. So when we have the specific function that does something, and even in the serverless space, I and even in Node.js space, I was working in one project where I counted that before getting requests and storing the data, we had seven layers. Seven layers. So getting back to our example, we are just doing basic mapping, creating command. And from now on, we can trust this command. And then we are running handle method because we know precisely which method we want to call. We don't need another layer or wrapper or mediator because we know, because we already know the intention and the context of this endpoint. And the handle method, the implementation of the handle method would differ from your preferred style. If you are in a, dot, in a DDD space, then probably here you would see your aggregate. If you are in a functional space, then this will be more like the implementation. So here I just have the function that takes some inputs and possibly could return some result or not. Here I'm not doing any fancy Mm, styles like aggregates etc because you know for adding product we don't need that possibly so what I'm just doing is I'm injecting functions like as a parameters and because of that I can unit test this function I can check if I'd like to whether those functions will be run as I want but in general it's your preferred style that you can put here the most important thing is to just segregate the the tooling from the business logic and keeping the specific intention. Because here, as we are following the CQRS principle, so we know that this will run some business logic and this will run this specific business logic, then maybe we don't need to, to introduce additional mediator or wrapper. We can just call it. And for getting queries, we could even run queries here because the worst thing that I'm seeing is like people are splitting CQRS into those small tiny classes and maybe introducing layers or not and then trying to unit test queries. Like This is, in my opinion, really bad approach and it's usually ending with some nasty production bugs even with entity framework that has in-memory capabilities to run it, then implementation against the specific database and uh, can differ a lot. So for example, in Martin, we also exposing the iQuery able and it's pretty neat, but we cannot support everything. And for example, entity framework started from version three to support like more advanced queries Previously, it was like fake it till you make it because uh, it was if, if, if it wasn't able to run the query, then it was evaluating all the objects and the rest of the query was run in memory, right? So, so I highly encourage to test it with the integration test. But still, we might want to test our queries without those HTTP endpoints, right? So... What we could do is, for example, just include the extension method for our either iQuery able or if we want to join something, then maybe hold DB context. And this method is just taking the query able, we can plug the real database here and then run the query and verify that with the integration test. And we are cutting the, all the layers that we don't need. So simple as that. So does anyone 
Did anyone read this book or know this book? Cool. Did you like it? Very much. Yeah. So I, I really highly encourage others to read it. It's about Atomic Habits. It's a book. It's not a programming book. So, but reading not only programming books is good. So it can open some eyes. And in my case, it was, I wouldn't say that it was revolutionary because I was already applying some of that. But when I thought about how we are working in our system, then if we have those folders like we have in this so-called um, mediator pattern, uh, mediator example, where we have this technical split, then it's like uh, looking at the mobile and then we are realizing that we are just one hour later scrolling through Instagram or whatever, right? So if we having those uh, folders here, then we are also making such distractions. And in Atomic Habits, James Clear wrote that we should try, like th there are no people with a strong will. There are just people that are in an environment that is helping them to, to, to achieve their goals in a sense that if our issue is that we are constantly checking mobile, then instead of trying to talk to ourselves, I have really strong will, I will keep it in my hand, but I won't touch it, I won't scroll it. Instead of that, let's just put it like here, right? And now I cannot just reach it and it might be good enough. So in the con our context is that if we are following the CQRS pattern, then we are, if we also go with the keeping those features within the same folders, like probably if we are adding new endpoint then we need or changing some endpoint, then we need to update the request, the endpoint mapping, the business logic of this specific feature. And might be that we don't need to touch anything else. And if we keep those things that are changing together at the same place, then we are enabling ourselves to make it to have less distraction and to be more focused. So it's about cognitive load, which is a smart term designed in 80s by this guy, John Sweller. Um, I will dim a bit this wall of text. And in general, John Sweller said that our working memory, so we uh, have cache-like processors. I mean, it's funny to explain how humans work by the processors, but <laughs> it's like that. Like we have this cache of what we remember and like what we are doing and it's really small and the, the 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 more we need to put there the most probable is that we will forget what we were about so it's like again like in atomic habits making environment that is supportive for us that it will help us on delivering the specific feature the business value and keeping things together that should be together <coughs> So if I look on the clean architecture and then each of these black lines, it is in fact the boundary. And not and boundaries are okay, but quite often those boundaries are changing into barriers that we cannot pass because we don't know what's behind that wall. Like each interface, like for me People are saying that, yeah, you, we should use as much interfaces as possible, even if we have just a single implementation. And interface is really not the greatest way to explain how this class would work, because we have those nullabilities and imprecise stuff, etc. Then my way is to making more it explicit. So instead of going this technical split, Let's do the, um, the slicing by feature and then give also our chance to maybe do most of them in a cruddish way, but those places, those features that are the most important for our business, dig, this gives us a chance for a small optimizations and improving this specific bit. Like what's the most dangerous, like changing, uh, code that is just copy and pasted 
or the code like this generic repository that is updating all of our entities. So changing this tiny thing in this repository can potentially break everything, right? So does CQRS add overhead to implementation? You have all of the data that I could pass to you, so it's up to you to decide. In my opinion, it's not. Like, I really don't know how people with those generic classes and uh, the number of layers are saying, no, no, this Cradish layered up uh, approach is really intuitive. I mean, maybe for some people it is, but not for me. But I have small cache in my brain, right? <laughs> so does CQRS require multiple databases? Have you seen multiple databases in approach? Like you even s didn't see the multiple tables there, right? So where this myth come from? It's like CQRS, as you saw, can use precisely the same table and we can get even some micro optimization there, which is good. And But we can do more optimization if we'd like to do some, for example, joins together and then we could create a database view or just that will select some part of the table or we'll do some more fancy stuff like CTE expression or whatever. And that's okay. But at some point we might see that mm, that we would like to do like view materialized view. And materialized view will get us better performance because it will touch the real data. But materialized view, even in relational databases, is already giving us the the eventual consistency. And what we might also do is, for example, use read replicas. And if we have this read replicas to enhance uh, the performance of our application because they won't be touching any writes, then with CQRS it's easier because we know precisely that this operation won't be changing anything and this will be. But still, if we have this read replica, then, then we already have multiple databases. But it's an option, it's not a must. And we might have also multiple types of databases because if we, for example, decide that we need some fancy filtering for our pro products registry, then we might add some Elasticsearch, right? But it's not like if we're starting with CQRS, then we need to use both. So we need to use both Postgres and Elasticsearch. It's an option, but it's an CQRS is an enabler for making that change easier and having the evolutionary approach. So does CQRS introduce eventual consistency? It might, but it might not. As you see, if we have the single table or, or we are using the storage that has the strong consistency guarantees, then we don't need to have uh, the, um, the eventual consistency. I mean, it's not that we should be scared about eventual consistency because in general that's how the real world works, right? If we are sending message, then it's not like it's popping out immediately uh, on the other side. And what about event sourcing? So event sourcing is a pattern. It's also a storage pattern. It's not a messaging pattern. It's a pattern where we get the command. So user intention, like withdraw cache from ATM. And in event sourcing, the name comes from the fact that events are the source of true. So events are our state. So the first thing that we do is that we are getting the events, rebuilding the state. So for example, if we withdraw money previously, then we are decreasing the state. If we got some incoming, uh, then we are increasing. And after that, we are getting the, 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 the regular entity and as a result, we are storing additional event. And we can use those events then to, for example, subscribe to those notification about those facts that were registered and update some read models. So by that meaning, event sourcing is a CQRS and CQRS are best friends. So they are like a tequila, a salt and lemon, but they don't need to go together. I mean, doing event sourcing without CQRS might be hard, really hard, because at one side you have this right side 
that is producing events and then you have this uh, other side that is building the read models out of that so by definition that follows the the secures pattern especially that to register m business meaningful events we need to know the precise in intention but still secures without even sourcing that's totally fine that's totally fine so where the myth that you need to use Kafka or Rabbit or other like messaging tooling comes from? It comes from the fact that you know people saw the benefits of the CQRS and also try to implement that with the our favorite nowadays approach with the microservices, pico services, nano services, etc. And in that way, if we have those multiple uh, deployments then we need to somehow synchronize and pass the information what happened in one place and to move it to to the other so for example uh, we we would like to have the local representation of the data in the other microservice to to not b need to query that service and to to get better autonomy so um, events and commands can be sent through the wire through the through the messaging system and that's totally fine and uh, that enables multiple options but still it's perfectly fine to use CQRS just in the context of the specific module without even using any uh, any messaging tooling even as I show you you don't need to use in-memory messaging tooling for that we, you might want but still it's an option so you know just because you can doesn't mean that you have to right and that's the mo one of the most common misconception is that if you are signing for the CQRS, then you need to use all of that. You don't. Eventually, you might end up with all of those tooling, but it shouldn't be like you are selecting the, the architecture pattern and you already know which tooling you will use. That's CQRS is about local optimization. As we know precisely what the business intention, what we want to do, then we can optimize that and uh, use, for example, in one place just the regular and ORM with entity framework, etc. But on the other places, we might use Elasticsearch or we might use some communication between services. But it's up to us to decide. And in my opinion, that's also the reason why I claim that CQRS is not adding additional complexity unless we add it on ourselves because we like to over engineering stuff right so to sum up CQRS is about segregating our uh, be be uh, behavior so we are breaking down our system with writes and reads or in fact not writes but business logic because the result of the command doesn't have to be changed state it might be we, we, we just pushed some event we generated some PDF sent an email it doesn't have to be changed state it's a business logic so CQRS gives us predictability because we know what's gonna be happening it's giving us the focus on business I know that it doesn't sound sexy to us developers who cares about business, we just want to play with technology, but in general, our systems are built for business. So if someone do doesn't know that, then at least this can be a thought from this talk. <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned, it gives us option to evolve. So we can start even from this single file application, delivery on production, and then evolve and extend with all those fancy Kafka rabbits, etc., and whatever we want to use eventually. And in my opinion, it gives us the easier system understanding, is especially if we give this explicitness, not if we are wrapping it again with the all the layers that we just wanted to drop. So if someone says that CQRS requires multiple databases, message bus, even sourcing eventual consistency. If some of your friends will claim that, then I hope that after this talk, you said that, well, actually, it does not. And that's all from me. Thank you.
If you'd like, then source codes, you can scan this uh, QR tag and, uh, yeah. uh, or you can find me later here or in internet.